Amen. Amen. It's, uh, we have two birthdays in our house this week. Uh, mine is on Tuesday and Becky's is on Wednesday. She's 43. And, uh, and <laughs> yeah, I, I'm obviously four years younger than that. Um, and, uh, but you know what they say? Don't, what they say, age is just a number. Age is just a number. It's how you feel that matters. But there are things that are making me feel increasingly old at the moment. Uh, Elijah found a CD player recently and you thought he had dug up an ancient prehistoric <laughs> fossil. And the funny thing is there's only one CD that we have in it and it's by some uh, African-American sort of R&B artist called Maxwell and he plays it over and over again and I went Becky was that not the music we used to make out to when we were curtain <laughs> and, uh, and it was I mean I hadn't planned to share that but uh, but we don't want to tell Elijah that because it'll scar him for life um, you know I, I, I've reached the age where uh, looking in the mirror is like watching the news uh, you know there'll be some developments that you don't like um, and you reach the stage where everybody, there's two things that kind of happen. Everybody your age, feel, like you look at them and you go, they must be, like they look older than I do. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm 47 this week, a shock and awe, I know. But I look at other, I'm like, they must be way older than I am. And, 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 and you also then reach the stage where you see younger people doing things and you go, they're too young to be doing that. Like, um, why Alan, where our little boy goes to school, got a new principal a couple of years ago, and you're like, that wee fella, for goodness sake, you know what I mean? He looks like he's about 16, no, he's about 35. But uh, in my head, you know, or you, or, or you see somebody maybe, like uh, the Tory race, you know, and you go, they're too young to be prime minister. They're not too young, it's just you're too old. Um, and, and you start to reevaluate re and see things in a new light, depending on your Age. You know, you start to rephrase things. It used to be your right knee and your bad knee, not your or your right knee and your left knee, not your good knee and your bad knee. Um, you know, you start to th talk about that. Um, I used to speak in youth groups. I was like the trendy youth speaker, and then a number of years ago, I was speaking, and I realised I was older than everybody's parents. And uh, I just went, I'm, I can't do this anymore. I sound like their, their, their grumpy dad up here um, speaking to them. I used to look forward to nights out. And now after one night out, I look forward to three nights in. Um, anybody else like that? One night out and you're like, oh, the next night you're like, it's lovely to have a night in. Like you're only out for half an hour the night before, but uh, it's just taken a lot out of you. Um, you know, you come back, you're, you know, you have a great week on holidays and you come back and you go, oh, it's so good to get back to your own yeah, no matter where you, it's good to get back to your own bed. It's good to get back. It's good to get back to comfort and familiarity. And, uh, and you get more and more set in your ways. You like things a certain way. You know, I'm at that stage where I don't want to try new restaurants. Like I know the, the four restaurants that I like and I know the, the two dishes that I like. And why mess with that? Why, why take the risk of them serving something that you might not like as much? And so I just, I like going to the same places, you know. I, I like having the same food. I don't really want to change that much. Um, you know, and in a sense, you know, age is just a number. And some people do act older sooner and some people seem to maintain their youth longer. But, you know, I, I, I find myself at times, I feel really young in one area and then I find myself being a really grumpy old man in the other area, like Elijah's starting to make fun of me that I'm actually starting to get rude. And I don't mean to be rude, I'm a minister, so I'm not meant to be rude, but you know, I just don't have time for like people trying to make small talk in situations, like when you're driving onto the beach and you're holding your National Trust card and they want to have a whole conversation with you about the tide coming in the tide. And you're just like, I just want to go to Harry's Shack. You know what I mean? I just want the burger, which is the only thing in the menu that I like. Um, I, I just, I don't really, and Elijah will be like, they were still talking to you and I was like, I know, and I was rolling up the window as they were doing it <laughs> and driving off. Um, pray for your minister because he is, he's becoming uh, increasingly grumpy in his old age. Uh, you know, and the passage we're looking at today, God is, uh, is talking about change. He's talking about if you become too rigid, if you become too set in your ways, if you become too inflexible, if you become too stuck in doing things a certain way, you might actually miss out on the new thing that God wants to do. Let's read uh, these verses from Mark chapter 2. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came to Jesus 
and asked him, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. What's going on here? Well, in all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the contest text is exactly the same. Jesus has been walking along the road. He's encountered this tax collector, this guy who was seen as a scum of the earth by the Jews because he collected taxes, taxes for the Romans. And he has had a conversation. He's had an interaction with him. And this guy, Levi, who becomes Matthew, is totally transformed. His life is turned around by Jesus. And because his life has been turned around by Jesus, he wants his friends to encounter Jesus. Because when Jesus transforms your life, you want him to transform other people's lives. And so he goes to all his kind of scummy, dodgy friends and he invites them all around for a party and he invites Jesus around for the party and Jesus goes to the party with the disciples and they're having a great old time in the party. And it's in that context that... Jesus has asked this question, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? In those days, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, fasted twice a week, eh, normally on a, on a Monday and a, on a Thursday. And it seems like John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, had just picked this up. It seemed the right thing to do. It wasn't prescribed by the law. It wasn't something that wasn't a command. The only day that Jews had to fast was one day a year in the Day of Atonement. I'm good with that because I hate fasting as you can tell um, but but uh, but they had decided that they wanted to fast twice a week they thought it was a good idea and it was they, they started off with noble intentions their, their their desires were good they they were fasting to to show their devotion to God and to ask him to intervene in their situation they were under the occupying Romans and they thought if we fast, if we do this sacrifice, maybe we'll get God's attention. Maybe God will come down. Maybe the Messiah, the promised Messiah will come and he will deliver us from all of these occupying Romans. And we want God to do something new in our midst. We want God to come and step into our midst. We want God to break into our situation. And so we're fasting. And so their, their desires were good. Their intentions were good. Their motives were good good and the disciples of John the Baptist were doing the same Monday Thursday we fast now I'm, I'm speculating here but I'm guessing that the event we're reading here about takes place on a Monday or Thursday when these guys are all fasting and they're hungry or as my wife tends to get hangry when you haven't eaten when she hasn't eaten for an hour and a half she she gets hangry uh, this was the week that uh, she uh, sacrificed things because she had only one breakfast this week uh, a couple of days my wife likes two breakfasts folks i know it's hard to tell but she she likes her first breakfast when she first gets up and then she likes a second breakfast a few hours later and one day yesterday at 11 o'clock she said i've only had one breakfast today you know, let's take a, I said, we should take a collection for you. <laughs> Bless her, only one breakfast. And, uh, and, 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 but but these, these guys were hungry because they're fasting. And when you're hungry and you see other people partying, when you see other people feasting, it rides you up and they get annoyed. And so they say, how come the Pharisees fast? How come John's disciples fast? But you guys are feasting. You guys are partying. You guys are having a great old time. You guys are indulging. What they're basically saying is this. Why aren't you doing things like we do? Why aren't you keeping our religious rules? Why are you changing things? Why are you doing things different? Why don't you fit into the typical religious stereotype? Why don't you do them the way they've always been done? Why aren't you sticking to our rules and traditions? Why are you changing things? You know, when we do something and we think it's right, we assume that everybody else should do it too. When we're really passionate about something, we kind of feel like everybody else should be passionate about it as well. When we believe something wholeheartedly, we want everyone else 
to believe it too because we think our way is the right way, especially as we get older. Our view is the right way. Our perspective is the right way. And anyone who disagrees, we may not say it out loud, but we silently judge them. We think, well, they, one day they'll uh, grow up one day and they'll start to see things the way we do when they mature a bit. I feel like I'm talking in a little bit of a Korean accent here now. And all the wee fellas were saying the other day to me, um, but <laughs> I have this thing that I do when I'm up there that I start to mimic them. Um, and uh, I feel like I'm starting to do it to say, I'm going to pull back into my ported on an accent. Um, but, but you start to think, what, why wouldn't people do things the way I do them? Why wouldn't they see things the way I see them? And Because I see things obviously the right way, and if they see them a different way, that means they see them the wrong way. And, and, and I'm not talking about biblical truth here. We don't get to mess with the Bible, and I'll get to that later on, okay? I'm not talking about things that are, are clear in Scripture. I'm talking about things that aren't clear, like what's happening here. Fasting two days a week was not a thing that God told them to do. It was a man-made rule. It was something that started off as a good thing to get God's attention, to get God to move in their nation. It was an expression of devotion and worship. But they have taken a good thing and they've turned it into a rigid thing. It's become a rule, a regulation that they think everyone else should follow. And if you don't follow it, then you're not as spiritual as we are. You're a wee bit liberal. You're a wee bit wishy-washy. You're a wee bit lax. A wee bit too, a wee bit too casual about your faith because you're not doing things how we do it. It wasn't biblical. It was man-made. It was good. But it's always possible to take a good thing and we become so rigid with it that we, it, it turns into something that actually hinders and prevents us from encountering and experiencing the new thing God wants to do in our midst. I was thinking about where this might apply in our own lives. I'm a big believer in taking daily time with God, okay? I, I, I try as often as I can every day to take time aside to read the Bible and pray. And that's a really good thing. But what if that becomes a bad thing? Because it becomes just a tick in the box thing where I do my 15, 20 minutes, I read my chapter every day, I say the same prayers every day and I get on with it and I feel good that I've done my religious thing but I haven't actually connected with God. It was a good thing but it's actually stopped me experiencing God. What about the way we worship it's really good. It's fantastic. But it's not exactly how it tells us to do it in the Bible. What if one day, and that hasn't happened now, what if one day the way we do things now actually becomes a hindrance to us encountering God? 35 minute sermons. We believe in teaching the Bible. We believe in opening the word of God week after week. It's a really good thing. What if God were to say, I want you to preach 15 minutes every week? We should be like, praise the Lord. We'd go back to two services again because it'd be packed. Uh, no, but what, or what, if, what if God said, Craig, instead of having the worship at the start, what if you preached at the beginning and all the worship was at the end? What if for a few weeks you had an hour of worship and 10, 15 minutes of preaching? I would struggle with that. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that tells us that's right or wrong, but I have a certain way that I like to do things. We come in, I welcome you, I read a scripture, I pray, we start. We sing three and a half songs. We do three songs and a, and a bridge. We do it every week. I preach, the worship team come back up, they play a song. You know, like when I was a kid, you knew you had the prayer book and you knew exactly where I was going to go. We're flexible, but we've just got our own prayer book. It's just only got half a page on it, but, but we've got our own way of doing things. And, you know, they're, they're fine and they work for us, but we shouldn't assume that it's the only way to do things. And if God wants to mix some of that stuff up, if he wants to change it, if he wants to reorder it, I think we need to be okay with that. We need to be open to changing anything that's not completely laid down in Scripture. And that's what's going on here. Jesus is, is being asked, why don't you do things the way we do them? Because we're doing them the right way and you're obviously doing them the wrong way. And look at what Jesus says in his response. Jesus answered, now how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is still with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And on that day they will fast. Where's all this chat about the bridegroom coming from? It seems completely irrelevant to what they're asking them, but it's actually not. Remember what Jesus said earlier about fasting? 
that they didn't have to fast. They wanted to get God's attention. They thought fasting would twist God's arm. They thought fasting would have God do something new. They thought fasting would have God intervene. They even thought that if they fasted twice a week, the Messiah might come. And here is Jesus, the Son of God, standing in front of them, and they don't recognize him. That's what he's saying. You're praying and fasting that the bridegroom would come and the bridegroom is here having a party among you and you're all dressed in funeral clothes. And don't bring a coffin to a wedding because it ruins the party for everyone. That's what he's saying. You are wearing funeral clothes to a wedding and you're thinking you're doing the right thing because you've absolutely missed that the thing you're praying for, the thing that you're fasting for, the thing that you're longing for is standing in front of you right now, but you don't recognize it because it hasn't showed up in the way that you thought it would or could or should. You're totally missing the new thing God is doing right in your midst because you're so busy focused on your man-made traditions and your man-made rules and your man-made regulations. There's a time for fasting. There's a time for mourning. There's a time for looking somber. But Jesus is saying, this is not the time. Open your eyes and see what God is doing among you. Perceive the new work of God in your midst. You're oblivious to it. There's a monumental shift happening right now before your eyes, but you're so intent on preserving the old thing and maintaining the status quo that you can't perceive the incredible new thing. God is doing. You know, God is always doing a new thing. It's amazing how the church tends to live in the old. We tend to live in the past. There's very few institutions in the world that struggle with change more than the church. And yet our Bible teaches us that our God is the God of the new. The psalmist told us to sing a new song to the Lord. Isaiah prophesied that God was doing a new thing and he was giving his people a new name. God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah that one day he would establish a new covenant. He would give his people new hearts. He would put a new spirit within them. The writer of Lamentation says that his mercies are new every morning. In John 3, Jesus says that we enter the kingdom through the new birth. The apostle Paul says that if anyone does that, they are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Paul says that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and we're to be made new in our attitudes. And the apostle John in Revelation has his vision of the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven and there's a new heaven and a new earth and Jesus declares at the very end of the Bible, behold, I make all things new but we get stuck in the old. We have a God who is doing new things all the time, but we miss them or we don't perceive them or we ignore them because we're too busy doing the same old things that we have always done. And Jesus is saying a new reality, the thing that you're praying for, something completely radical has diff and different has entered your earth from heaven. The kingdom has come in me and you're missing it because you're too busy fasting on a Monday and a Thursday. And then I asked myself, well, what about me? What about you? What is the new thing that God might be doing in your life right now that you're missing? If God is always doing a new thing, can you see, can you perceive what's the new thing he's doing in your life in this season? Or are we so stuck in our ways and our routine and our our habits that we're missing the new thing God is doing in front of us. It's a really, I think it's a really important question for every one of us to ponder. I'm really trying to wrestle through this in this time. God, what are you doing in my life right now? Because things feel different. Things feel different in my relationship with God. Things feel different in my ministry. Things feel different in my interactions with other people. And so I'm going, God, I know you're doing something new. I'm just not sure what it is. Any, anybody else feel like just things are different, but it's really, it feels blurry. It's hard to define. It's hard to, de it's hard to put your finger on, but you just know that something is different. But it's almost like you're, you haven't emerged through to see the fullness of it yet. 
It's almost like something is gestating, something is growing, something is being birthed, but it hasn't been birthed yet and you haven't seen. And you're just, I'm like, God, what are you doing? I know you're doing something new in our church, but I don't know what it is yet. I know you're calling us to do something new in our local community, but I haven't really figured out exactly what that is yet. I know you're doing something new in our hearts, in our worship, in how we pursue the spirit, and how we're seeing the supernatural break out in healing, and how you're actually going to work in our midst. I know you're doing something, but I don't know. And that's where God would say to me, just stop and ask me, God, what are you doing? What are you doing in our midst? Take time to listen. God doesn't change, but the way he interacts with us does. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but we're not. And so the way he relates to us changes. And Jesus here is speaking to the people at a time of massive upheaval and massive change and massive transition as the Son of God, the Messiah, comes into the culture Things are changing and the change isn't stopping, but they're going to miss it if they don't recognize it and adopt their life to the new thing God is doing. And we are living in a time of massive change. Just watch the news. Everything is being disrupted. Everything is shaking that can be shaking. And things are being stripped away. And it happened for two years with the C word. And, and, and it's still happening with the war. And it's happening with inflation. And it's happening with the, the, the price of fuel. And we're in this season of turbulence and transformation and change. And God is doing something new in the midst of all of that. And I just, I don't know what it is, but I want to say, God, let me see what you're doing. Let me perceive it. I don't want to just come in here and do what I do every week and go through Monday to Saturday doing what I always do and to miss the new thing that you are doing in our midst. How do we respond in a time of major change? In a season when everything seems to be changing, two things, and then I'm done. Two things. Jesus tells us how we respond at this time of major change. The first thing is this, get rid of anything that's incompatible with your future. Get rid of anything that's incompatible with where God is taking you. Look at verse 21. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth onto an old garment, otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. It's school uniform season, parents. Anybody bought their uniforms yet? Anybody been down to Robert Davison? Use the code HOPE22 and you get 1% off. That man lives to give. Eh? Is he here? Where are you? Is he here? There, there he is. There he is. Yeah. There he is. I mean, I mean, other shops are available, but they're not as good as Robert's. We haven't bought ours yet, so I'm expecting big things when I go in for those YL and T-shirts. You know, and there's that balance, isn't there, when you're buying uniforms? And you'll see this, Robert. You know, you want, uh, the, the parents want a uniform that fits but doesn't fit too well. They want one that they will grow into. Because especially with the Robert's price, no, especially with the, you know, no one cheaper in the area. Um, especially this week for me. Um, you, you especially with the inflation and all the price of fuel, you don't want to have to go back in three months when your kids had a growth spurt and buy another uniform. So you buy it a little bit too big, you know. I mean, Elijah's nine, and I'm sure the 17-year-old uniform that I've got him, he will grow into it, son. Um, you know, it might, it might be way too big now, but he'll, he'll grow into it. But you don't, want, you don't want to, and so you buy it a little bit too big. And, and I don't know if parents still do this. Um, when I was a kid, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that, but my wife can't sew. Um, <laughs> but my mum could. Okay. <laughs> mm. Would somebody have the car running out there? <laughs> and I will just, at the end of this, during the worship, just... But so, you know, Elijah doesn't mind oversized stuff is what I'll say, okay? Um, that's a nice way of putting it. He likes oversized clothes. And so when we buy on trousers that are too big now, he's fine to wear them like hanging down a bit. He's fine. But when I was a kid, you got them taken up. Yeah? Your mum took them up. And then as you grew, 
She let them down. And there was a wee line that you could never get rid of. <laughs> Any of you? See, you younger people, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about here. And that was fine if it, I mean, everybody could see where you that let them down. And that was fine if they only let them down once, but if you had a particular growth spurt that year, 27 lines it would be. It was like cut the tree open, you know, you could see exactly how, how many times that those things had been let down. Like you were walking around with rings around the bottom of your ankles, you know, and, 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 and that was, that, that, you know, that was the way it was. And, and then what if you fell and there was a hole in your trousers? I know. I mean, if it was a small hole, it could be sewn up and that was all right. But if it was a big hole, it had to be patched. And if you could get a bit of cloth from, you know, an old pair of trousers that matched, that was fine. But uh, whether it was school trousers or something else, maybe a pair of jeans. You know, today, the young ones pay for tears in their jeans. You know, some wee, some wee Indonesian seven-year-old in a sweatshop has, like, earned a dollar a year to put those holes in your jeans. And, uh, but, 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 but back when I was a kid, when you had a hole in your jeans, it didn't mean you were trendy, it meant you were poor. Okay? Uh, and so your mum wanted to, to put... And, 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 if she could get a bit of denim, but if the hole was particularly bad, they stuck a patch on. Who remembers patches? Those kind of oblong things that there was kind of plastic on one side and material on the other, and you ironed them on? Remember? Some of you have no idea. Like, some of you have no clue. Like, you are living the dream. Like, and, and if it was a pair of jeans, they would get like a, a denim patch, but it would never be anywhere close to the shade of the jeans that you had. You know, and, and there was always one side of the patch that stuck better than the other side. And so within a week or two, half the patch would be hanging down and then the other half would be stuck on because, because that was just the way it was, because it didn't fit properly. Well, Jesus here is talking about patches. He's talking about patching old things up. Look at what he says. He says, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old making the tear worse. What Jesus is saying is this. Some things just aren't compatible. Some things shouldn't be mixed together. In fact, if you try to blend two things that are incompatible, it can actually be damaging and harmful. It can tear and it can rip and it can make the whole thing worse than the original tear was. It can destroy both the old and new. And what Jesus is saying in this context is this. I didn't come to patch up your old religion. You can't attach the completely new thing God is doing to the old thing you are doing because the two things are incompatible. You have to choose one or the other. You can't hold on to the old and embrace the new. If you try to keep them both, you're actually going to tear the whole thing apart. The old covenant was based on the law and keeping the rules. The new covenant is based on grace and a relationship with me. The old covenant was based on, on guilt and sin and the sacrifice of animals. The new covenant is based on the sacrifice of the sinless, spotless Lamb of God who takes our sin once and for all. In the old covenant, it was performance-based. It was about what you did to work your way to God if you kept the commandments, if you kept the rules. The new covenant is God coming down to us. And it's not about my performance. It's about the finished work of Jesus Christ. The old covenant says do, 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 do. The new covenant says done. When Jesus says it is finished. In the old covenant, you had to go to the temple to meet with God. In the new covenant, God comes and resides within you because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. In the old covenant, you had to go to a priest as a mediator. In the new covenant, we are all priests before God. We don't need a mediator because Jesus Christ is our mediator. Jesus says they're completely incompatible. It's grace or it's works, but it's not both. It's what you do or what God has done in Christ. It's law or gospel. It's either depending on your righteousness or the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, but you cannot mix the two together because if you try to mix them, you'll tear the whole thing apart. It's either 100% Jesus finished work on the cross or it's 100% your best effort, but it can't be both. It can't be 50-50, 70-30, 80-20 or 90-10. It's all Jesus or it's all you, but don't try to patch a little bit of Jesus onto you. 
And isn't that what we do? And isn't that what we offer as a church sometimes? Come to Jesus and he will enhance your life. He will make your life a little bit better. And we try to patch Jesus on to an otherwise decent life. And it just doesn't work. Jesus is not a life enhancement. He is a life transformer. Jesus didn't come to make somebody who was derelict a little bit better. He came to help people who were dead come back to life. Your problem isn't that you were just a little bit dirty or a little bit derelict or a little bit defunct. Your problem was that you were dead in sin. And dead people don't need polished up. Dead people need revived. And that's what Jesus came to do. And so you can you can put makeup on a dead person. You can try to, you know, you, you can try to put a nice suit on them, but they're still dead. Where Jesus says, No, I have come that you may have life. You don't need a little patch of Jesus. You need all of Jesus or you're still as dead as you were before you even encountered him. Jesus is not just a patch onto your life. He is your life. It's not that you just need a new door in the house. The whole house is derelict and it needs completely burnt down and remade. Jesus says if anyone, or or Paul says if anyone is in Christ, they are a semi-new creation. They're kind of a slightly better. No, they are a new creation. Jesus came to make you new, not better, not polished up, not good living, not slightly more religious, not that you've got some now add-on that you tag on to your week. Well, you've got rugby on a Monday and you've got badminton on a Tuesday and you've got Jesus on a Sunday. That is not how it works. He is not some hobby that you do on a Sunday morning. He is your life. He is your only life. Everything else fits in around him. He does not fit in around you. The gospel of Jesus Christ produces radical change. It interrupts and it disrupts. It upsets before it resets. And we have to make room for the reality that it brings. And I just wonder, is there anything that you are holding on to in your life that is incompatible with the future that God is bringing you into? Are there things in your life that you just know deep down they're not right? You know they're not good. You know they're not helpful. Relationships, things you're doing, habits. We all have them. You know what I'm saying? Is there, there, oh, we all have them. And God is saying, I want to bring you into a new thing, but you cannot keep that thing patched on to you. I want to do something completely new. Don't try to stick things together that aren't compatible. You know, in marriage we say, when I'm doing a, a wedding, I say, uh, what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. What God has put asunder, stop trying to put back together. If God has said separate from that, it's time to put it away. So the first thing we need to ask is this. Is there anything that's incompatible with where God is leading me? And second is I finish, and I am finishing now. What do I need to let go of? It follows on from this. What was once good but no longer works? You see, it may not be incompatible, or it may not be incompatible. It may be compatible. It may be good. It may have worked as well. It may have served a purpose, but it just doesn't work anymore. It once produced life. It was once fruitful. It was once blessing. It was once beneficial, but it no longer is doing that. And God is saying to you, I want you to get rid of it. That's where the last verse talks about. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskin. Here's a picture of a wineskin. Oh, it came up. Yeah, does it? It's kind of not what I was expecting. I thought maybe some sort of first century Versace or Gucci, you know, satchel type thing. It's it's okay. You can take it. Away. It was a it was the skin of an animal, a, a goat, and basically it was just the hide of a, an animal, and and uh, and and they tied it at one end, and the other end they poured the wine into it, and it was used as a spout, and you would pour the wine out of it, and it, it needed to be flexible because as the wine, as the grape juice fermented, it expanded and it stretched, and there needed to be some give in it, and and, and as the gases were given off, and so the thing about a wine skin was it needed to be flexible, and that's why the leather was useful. And so you would use it, you would empty it, you would use it again, it would be stretched a bit more, but it would be, there would still be a little bit of give in it. And then the third time you would use it, it was probably at its limit. 
It had stretched as much as it was going to stretch. There was no more give. And at that point, you had a decision to make. Do I keep using something that was once good but is no longer going to work? Or do I do something new? Do I get a completely new wineskin? Do I get a skin that's never been used, that's been flexible, that's pliable, that has the ability to stretch, to hold and increase capacity? And to me, that seems logical. Of course you want to get a new wineskin because if you don't, the wineskin's going to burst and it'll be ruined and the wine is going to go all over the floor and it will be ruined. So why wouldn't you do it? Because replacing an old wineskin with a new one is costly. There's a price to be paid. There's the work of skinning the goat. But even before that, there's the cost of killing one of your goats. There's a sacrifice involved, especially for the goat. That's why why people would sometimes keep using the old wineskin over and over again because they weren't willing to pay the price. They weren't willing to pay the cost or the sacrifice of getting a new wineskin. It was too high a price to pay. And we all get attached to things from the past, don't we? So we keep trying to use the old thing. It's just human nature. We're creatures of habit. I've talked about that in my own life. We like the comfortable, the familiar. We're nostalgic. The good old days we hearken back to. If you were to go onto my phone and to Spotify, all the music I love is from the 90s. I love the Counting Crows and Pearl Jam and all those bands that were in the 90s because they remind me of the good old days. Not that these are good days now, but they were the, you know, they were the days when I was in my prime when I was at my youngest. I loved listening to all of that rock and pop music and I played guitar and I loved it all. And I love listening because it's nostalgic. Listen to Guns N' Roses, uh, Sweet Child of Mine and Paradise City. And obviously I don't listen to devil's rock music like that now. But, um, but all of those, I, just, I loved all that because it's nostalgic. It brings back certain memories. We love memories attached to the old thing. And at the time, those things were good. But here's the thing that struck me. That's probably obvious to you. Every old wineskin was once a new wineskin. It began as a really good thing. Every old way of doing things was once a new way of doing things. You know, I was reading somewhere this week that many of the old hymns by Wesley and Isaac Watts, when they first came out, people refused to sing them because they were too modern. Isn't that interesting? And now the churches that sing them refuse to sing anything written after 1980 because it's too modern. Because we, we love the old We get attached to it and we think it's the only way of doing it. In the last 30, 40 years, there's been more change than in the last 500. 40 years ago, we didn't have smartphones. We didn't have internet. We didn't have email. We didn't have Facebook or Instagram or Amazon or online dating or Netflix or MP3s. You had four channels to choose from. And you didn't have a remote control. I was the remote control. Craig, change the channel okay like, like you didn't have a remote control hard to believe people you didn't have live streaming on the internet this would have been a tape ministry we'd have posted out a tape if anyone would have wanted it we didn't have coffee snobs you had maxwell house that was it what is it you an oat milk cappuccino I don't know what they do to squeeze those oats to get the milk out of them, and I don't want to know. I just find that unbelievable. We didn't have these screens. We had the overhead projector. That was always a wee bit out of focus and gave you a migraine for two days. Things have changed unbelievably, and there are structures and styles and ways of thinking that are outdated, but we keep doing them because they were good at the time but they're no longer good they served a purpose they served a function they were helpful but they're no longer helpful you see the thing about the wineskin is this it's never meant to be about the wineskin it's always about the wine and this is where I want to land today it's the wine that's valuable and what's the wine it's the Holy Spirit That's what Jesus is talking about. It's the new activity of God among his people. All the other stuff is just structure. This is a wineskin. This is wineskin. Kids ministry, wineskin. Crash, wineskin. Denomination, wineskin. It's all wineskin. What's the wine? The presence of God. But what happens is this. 
we start to pay more attention to the wineskin than we do about the wine. We start to get more focused on the structure, on the systems, on the committees, on, on, on how we do things, on, on the style than we do on the person of the Spirit. And then over time, it all becomes about the structures. And that's, that's what I see in my own denomination. That's what I see in most churches, actually. I don't mean that in a slow... I just I, I can see it in this church at times. Now, we get more caught up with the way we do things than the person we're doing them for. We get more caught up with how we do and, 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 and structure things than we do with is the presence of God. Because you can have a really good church service and you can have an amazing band and you can have a wonderful kids ministry and you can have an amazing building and you can have good preaching. You can have all of that, but if the presence of God isn't here, all you're doing is worship in the wineskin. And it's never about the wineskin. It's never about the wineskin. It's always about the wine. And I believe that the Lord wants to say to us at this time, I am going to pour new wine. And I can sense it in the room even this morning that the Lord is doing something among us. The Lord is starting to stir something afresh among us. And my prayer is this, that he will show us what we need to do to be the container to carry the capacity that he wants to pour into us. He wants to do something through us in this local community in the days ahead. I actually believe that what is going to happen, as painful as it's going to be with the economy and fuel and all of that, is going to be the greatest gift that God has given this church to reach the local people in this community. That we are going to be a storehouse. We're going to be a resource. People who would never have come near us are going to come to us. We're going to pray for them. We're going to help them. We're going to resource them. We're going to bless them. And we're going to see them come to know Jesus. That's what it's about. It's not about just this. This is great. But it's about the new wine. And you know what? There's new wine out there that hasn't even come in here yet because it doesn't even know it's new wine. There's people out there this morning who are going to know Jesus and they have no idea yet. And they're just saying, is there a place that I can come? You know, there's some things don't change. The word of God never changes. It never changes. The authority of scripture, the power of the spirit, but everything else is open to change. All of it's just a wineskin. And if you have a beautiful wineskin with no wine, the whole thing just becomes boring and empty and dead. And in this time of significant change in our world and in our lives and in our culture, I just really believe that the Lord is asking us those two questions that I started with. What is there that's incompatible with what I'm doing? What is there in your life that you need to just go, you know what, I've been trying to patch this on, this old thing on to the new thing, and I can feel the pressure, and I can feel the tearing, and I can feel the tension. I can feel the frustration, and I need to actually let that go. And what is there that was once a good thing? It was once helpful, and it could be a, a, st a structure, it could be a relationship, it could be someone you met up with every week and it used to be life-giving, but it's now draining. It could be a mindset, it could be a way of doing things, it could be how you relate to God. There's lots of things, but I believe God is saying, just because it was good doesn't mean it's for now. What do you need to do to contain the new wine that I want to pour out? Because the only thing that will survive in these days are things that are not rigid or inflexible or set in their ways. You see, we can honor the past. We can build on the past, but we cannot live in the past. And I just, I got a message a few weeks ago from an Australian friend. I felt it was really relevant to many of us this morning as I do finish. If I... Uh, an Australian friend who's a prophet, um, she's been recognized as a prophet in Australia for many years. And um, on the 8th of this month, she sent me a, a, a message. And I, I really believe it's not just for me, but I actually believe it's for others here. She said, I had a dream of you the other night, which is, I had to let my wife know that. I had a dream of you the other night and you were trying to take your jacket off because it was uncomfortable and you didn't want to wear it anymore. 
and it was quite tight and you were struggling to get it off and you were getting frustrated and angry with it and you were wrestling with this dumb jacket, you finally got it off. And I feel like even for some of you right now, you can totally relate to that. You're, you're wearing something that used to fit because you wouldn't have put it on if it didn't fit. But now it feels tight. It feels restrictive. It feels like it's containing you and you don't want to wear it anymore. And you're struggling to get it off, but you're, it just doesn't seem to be coming off. And I believe that the Lord has said, I want you to take that off and I will help you. It doesn't fit anymore. It doesn't fit you anymore. It was good for a time, but it doesn't fit you anymore. Would you bow your head? I actually want to pray for people who that applies to, or those who, who have really sensed that there's something that God has spoken. But particularly that last word, while every head's bowed, if that word applies to you, if there's something that you know that you need to take off, would you just slip up your hand real quickly in the room? Okay, okay, okay. And here's what I want to do. I want to pray for us all. And I want to pray for me as the person who leads this church. And I want to pray for our management team and our trustees. And I want to pray for you. That God would show us in these days. He would show us the new thing he's doing in our lives. He would show us what we need to stop trying to stick on to our old life. And he would show us what good thing we need to let go of. And so, Holy Spirit, right now, I ask that you would come. And Lord, yours is a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And so, Lord, would you reveal to us, would you reveal to us those things in our lives that you're doing right now? Those things that seem muddy and blurry and hard to decipher or discern would you show us what you're doing we know, we just sense there's something happening but we're not sure what it is lord would you it's a bit like the and it was nearly preached on this passage you know the, the blind man that jesus touches his eyes once and he says what do you see and he says i see trees but they're walking around like people it's almost like the vision was blurry it was getting there and i feel like that's for some of you that the lord is then he touched him again and and they could see things clearly. And I believe that some of you have almost had the first touch and you see things blurry, but he wants to give you the second touch today. And for those places in our lives where we have tried to patch you on, Lord, we repent of that. And Lord, we want to say it's 100% Jesus. It's all Jesus. This church is all about Jesus. My life is all about Jesus. I'm not depending on anything that I do. I'm depending on what Christ Jesus has done. And for those of us who are still carrying an old wineskin, hoping that it still works because of sentimental value. There's some of you here even, and I want to be careful as I say this, but I need to be direct today. Some of you are feeling a false loyalty to an old place, an old church, an old denomination. And it's, it's purely tradition and loyalty that's keeping you there. And you know your heart is somewhere else, but your guilt is keeping you there. God never keeps anyone somewhere out of guilt. Guilt is not God's way of, of growing you. And I believe God wants to cut off false loyalty. Good loyalty is good, false loyalty is bad. Holy Spirit, would you come and sever those things that we need to cut off? Help us to identify them and not to be ruthless or rude, but just to let them go. Holy Spirit, would you come? Band, would you come up? Just Let's just continue just to settle in the presence of God. Holy Spirit, continue just to minister among us. And would you fill us afresh with new wine? Holy Spirit, would you come and fill us afresh today? And wine also symbolizes joy. And I believe, as I said at the start, the Lord wants to pour out fresh joy. Because some of you are weary. 
Some of you are just tired. But I believe the Lord wants to pour out fresh joy. So Holy Spirit, would you come and pour out fresh joy? Would you come and pour out your presence into our lives? We receive, we receive, we receive, we receive. Amen. Let's stand together. Got nothing new. 